Um, thank you. Um, apparently, I have to stand here. Um, yeah, Adam sort of talks about this as the next 33 years on a sheet of paper. And I've been having a bit of a think about that, and I think I, think I can do a bit better than that. I, the next 33 years, I think basically in three letters is OMG, <laughs> possibly WTF, um, or worse. Um, Adam sort of nailed it there slightly. It's, it's a bit like somebody sort of crunched up the future, put it in front of our face, and it's all opened at once, which is, I mean, this is quite an assault to the senses. In fact, I got an email recently saying, oh, look, it's really funny, you've got too much information on your map. And I thought, oh, <laughs> really? I didn't see that. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I, don't, I cannot get to grips with whether this is just me and it's just my age and experience, or has the world gone slightly bonkers? Um, I use this sort of phrase I'm quite fond of in, in one of the books, you know, it's moved to the outskirts of normal. I think that's kind of, kind of, I mean, I still think I'm, with Trump, I'm living in a sort of episode of South Park or something. Um, you know, so it has, the, has the world got a bit weird or, or is it just me? And the answer is, is probably a little bit of both. And this is my, well, what I'd like to say, this is my attempt to sketch out what's going on now and where we might go. It's a sort of route map of possible futures, if you like. But it's also, uh, probably more realistically, this is what's in my head right now, which is possibly a little bit alarming. So I'm trying to sketch out sort of new landscapes and, and colour in some sort of distinguishing features. Is it a map of the future? I mean, everyone you know, talks about this as being a map of the future, not surprisingly, because it says, you know, out for 2050. I mean, it, I mean, it is and it isn't. It's, to some extent, uh, uh, quite seriously, it's a map of now, quite seriously. And in the middle, it's very, very much now. But obviously, it sort of goes out to the edges. But I think... There's almost no such thing as now in my mind. N now is influenced by the past and the future. You know, the, the, the past and the, and the future are always present, if you like. Um, and that's to some extent inevitable. Um, and I suppose the key thing is this is about potential directions of travel. This is not set in stone. And if you don't like things, like people preferring the company of machines to people, we should damn well do something about it. And it really winds me up a lot about people thinking, well, the, the future is just this thing. It's unknowable. It's very strong. And it just comes, and you have to react. You either jump on board and kind of surf the wave, or, if you like, or you're going to get drowned. And there is some truth in that. But it's also fundamentally true that you know, the future is created by what you and I decide to do today and tomorrow, fundamentally. And there's a point here, um, which isn't my idea at all, there's a lovely guy, the smartest guy I've ever met in my life, um, called Theodore Zeldin, who's a sort of 85-year-old historian at Oxford. And he, he said, he's actually said to me about 10 years ago, I don't know why you waste your time thinking about the future, Richard. It's a total waste of time. You know, why do people keep doing that? Why don't we spend more time discussing what we want to happen in the future and how we might get there, rather than worrying about what might happen and how we might react. And I think there's a tremendous amount of, of truth there. So yeah, this, this is a sort of possible directions, possible landscapes that, that we can change if we, if we like them. And there's also some small print here saying that, where does it go? Um, you know, alteration works can take place and some routes will be replaced without notice. Um, you see, that he has the odd joke in. In fact, there's this very serious one down here, which is, one of the global risks is people taking this kind of thing seriously. I, I went into a very, very large German company once, um, car making company, and the strategy department had this blown up, not this, but a previous version, blown up on the wall about four times the size of this. And they were, they were literally using it as a for, for, for corporate strategy. I mean, this is a big company. And I was somewhat alarmed, so I, I feel I have to sort of put, put that in there. Um, so yeah, so things, things can, can change. Now, the other thing is a lot of stuff that's not on the map. This is, this is what's happening now. These big blobs are mega trends. It's all about change. But there's a lot of stuff that's not changing, that's not actually not on the map at all. And I think the main thing that's not really changing that much is us. You know, in the beginning of the book, there's a quote by Edward O. Wilson, who's an evolutionary biologist in the US. And the gist of the quote is something like, we have paleolithic brains, medieval institutions, and the technology of the gods. And that's why I think I'm a bit jittery at the moment. In fact, you know, we've got anxiety. I don't know where the middle of the map is. I had a long debate about where's the middle. And actually, for a very long time, I thought individualism was the, was the middle of the map. And I wanted it to be in the, in, the, in the middle of the map. And I thought long and hard about, you know, is that I still don't think that's quite the right phrase. I mean, the National Intelligence Council in the US published a list of, me of megatrends, and they had individual empowerment as one of their key trends. And I didn't like that. That was a bit too positive. But I never quite sort of settled on the right wording. 
But actually, a lot of people think the middle of the map is anxiety, which is quite interesting, which maybe says something more about them than the map. But there is a lot of it about. I think there's 8 million people in the UK suffer from anxiety. Um, medical treatment for anxiety-related disorders in the US has increased tenfold since the 80s. And I think the reason th there's a lot of that is because of all of that. Um, there was a book, I don't know if you remember this, there was a book in 1972 came out called Future Shock by Alvin and Heidi Toffler. And I haven't read it for a very long time, but my memory of the book is that this, the, co the key thesis of the book was that the perception of too much change over too short a period of time would create some kind of mental instability at an individual and institutional level. The, the key word there is perception, obviously, because I, I think an awful lot of stuff, us in particular, isn't really changing very much. We exaggerate the change. Um, so maybe that's, that's why there is the anxiety. Um, there's also other things going on here. I mean, the, the, the middle big blobs are the megatrends. And a lot of this is from other people. I mean, it's, it's, it's from Ernst & Young and PwC and McKinsey and National Intelligence Council and the Ministry of Defense and, you know, um, Davos and God knows what. Um, and I've sort of just basically looked into them and, I, and then I added them. And then there's the stuff I just sort of came, came up with or by myself or I sort of read about it from somewhere else and thought, right, I'll steal that, I'll have that. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the common ones you hear about a lot, we've got climate change, we've got urbanization, we've got falling fertility, um, globalization, population growth. I've got virtualization, but most people call it digitalization, but there's no, no great difference. Um, and then I've added a few. The, the Department of Defense in the US, by the way, they came up with this really interesting term, I don't know if you've come across this, called VUCA in 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down which was volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and all of those are on the map. And then I threw in all sorts of other things, like decline of trust. Um, I was reading a report by Edelman, and, and that seemed pretty compelling. Easternization, which is obviously a bit of a spin on globalization. Localization, hardly anyone talks about. But I, and, and then a map I did 10 years ago, localization was a tiny little point, and I'd blown it up. And I had a big discussion about wouldn't it be quite provocative if you made that bigger than that? You know, if localization was bigger than globalization, but I put them at the same size so they could fight each other a bit. And actually, technically, that's wrong because there's, if you go down here, these, there's a few things which are squares, which are counter trends. And actually, I think that really is, is a big square. It's a mega counter trend, probably. Um, we've got these little things here. I mean, the future is usually thought of by, particularly by technologists, but also by futurists and a bunch of other people as new stuff events to some extent, but new stuff, new inventions in particular, that come along. And yeah, that's absolutely true. But I think it's equally about stuff that we're incredibly familiar with that just falls away, um, possibly becomes extinct or certainly falls away from common usage. So I've got these little sort of piles of rubble here, which I call partial ruins, um, which I actually rather fond of these. That's solitude all by itself, which I'm very fond of that one. <laughs> um, we've got privacy, peripheral vision, which was basically all about people staring at phones all day. Um, willingness to admit mistakes. I mean, it gets, it gets slightly sort of philosophical, actually, from time to time. Biodiversity, coral reefs, manual gearboxes, humility, empathy, um, patience, good manners, um, generosity of spirit. You can tell I'm a certain age, can't you? Um, <laughs> use of cash, saving inheritance, and, and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the big stuff is the mega trends, and that's kind of what I'm talking about now. This is all... I think almost without exception happening now. I mean, the only one that's sort of maybe on the cusp a bit is digital self-actualization, which I actually can't quite remember what it, what it means. I just sort of came up with it. Oh, that sounds nice. I'll stick it on the map. Um, and then I really liked it, and I made it a big blob, and I don't know. Who knows? Um, I quite like that. Um, and then as you, obviously as you go sort of further into the, the corners, it becomes much more speculative and much more future. And these sort of little circles here, these are sort of what I've called nows. So this is stuff that's absolutely happening now, although it's not necessarily everywhere. I mean, it's the old William Gibson quote about the future being unevenly distributed. I mean, if it's going on in California, it doesn't necessarily mean it's happening in Woking. Um, and then you've got these nexts here, which are either almost non-existent or, I mean, synthetic meat exists, but you can't buy it in Tesco quite yet. Um, and we can have a nice debate about exactly when. So, yeah, you, you sort of go into the future more as you get into the corners. It becomes a bit more extreme in the corners. Down the bottom, you've got a bunch of global risks. Um, I tried to, do, or they're, they're global game changers. And I started writing these, and it dawned on me that, God, they're depressing. Um, this is partly because I, I did a couple of workshops with the Cabinet Office on extreme risks and came out quite jittery. And um, certain things you can't talk about, but certain things you can just change the wording a bit. Um, 
I did try to do a version where the game changes are all incredibly positive. It's very difficult. It's, it's a bit like thinking of utopian sci-fi. I mean, you get to Star Trek and you kind of stop. Most of it's dystopian. And th th this sort of naturally happens, I think, when you think of things that could go very, very wrong. I mean, the only really big global game changes I could think of that were really utopian were there's one around sort of energy, new energy technology that make energy so cheap we don't even bother measuring it or paying for it. It's just free, basically. And you could obviously have all kinds of things around, around healthcare and so on. Um, there was quite a good story. Uh, this took about two years. I mean, I, I was seriously doing it for about three months, but the, the, from beginning to end took about two years. And for the first 18 months, I had Donald Trump really is president as a global game changer. And if you, the bottom one over there, which is the hand-drawn one, he's on there. And the brilliant thing about that, he, it, just from serendipity point of view, he was just underneath decline of human intelligence, which I thought was brilliant, <laughs> which is still on there. Anyway, he came off because he actually did become president. And I probably should have left him on as getting a second term or something, but I just sort of took him off. Um, now, you might think, well, going back to the anxiety thing, oh, it's all a bit depressing, really, isn't it? Or maybe it's just me. And I think we need some perspective here. Um, in fact, talking of perspective, there's this tiny little bit of text down here which says projection subjective. Um, I think I could sort of add to that with some more context, which is that one of the problems with the future is we project from recent personal past experience or recent data. And by recent, I, I, I mean sort of five years, probably. It's, it'd be rare to go much more than five. So if it's a bit doomy and gloomy, we project the doom and gloom into the future. Um, and we also project our worldview. So we project Bermondsey as opposed to what's going on in Shanghai. If you were sort of asking the question in Shanghai, you might get a completely different perspective. And it's weird because if you objectively look at the human experience, going back to this thing, I mean, you could go back a lot further than 1817. You know, there's never been a better time to be alive than now. I, I don't think that's really debatable. I think if you question that, you haven't been paying attention. We have doubled human lifespans in little more than a century. I mean, there is, there is a bit of a cheat on that, because if you take out infant mortality, we haven't, actually. If you walk around very old graveyards, you see plenty of people that reach the age of 85. But putting that to one side, we have basically increased human longevity substantially. We have halved extreme poverty in slightly more than 20 years. There are more women in education and work globally than there's ever been. In fact, there was a thing in The Economist a while back saying that more women in the economy globally has been responsible for a higher increase in GDP than the creation of the internet. Although we, you know, we never think about that. We never sort of talk about it particularly. Um, you know, look at people dying or fighting in wars. We all think it's terrible now, and you can point to some wars, but compared to, you know, there's a good one. Um, there's another one, some, oh dear, hello. <laughs> um, somewhere there. Um, curing diseases, infant mortality, literacy rates, access to clean water and sanitation. I mean, these are major achievements that we just somehow don't think about. Um, we just think the world's getting worse. And I think an element of this is generational. When you get to a certain age, you, get, you put on your rose-tinted spectacles and think, oh, it's much better when we had Monopoly or something than Fruit Ninja or whatever. Um, and there is some truth in that, but actually there's plenty of research I've seen that that suggests that this sort of anxiety is, is not just generational, it's, it's out there. And I do think it's back to that, that thing of the speed and depth of change that, that's causing that. So we, we should always remember that and not get too sort of stuck up in, in the negative stuff. Did anyone see a film called Tomorrowland? In, I think it was 2015, it was a Disney film. And there was a quote which is really cheesy and I'm not quite sure where it's come from. I think some people say it's an old American Indian saying, but the, the, I don't know if it was the end of the film, but it was somewhere towards the end of the film. He tells this story about there's two wolves in a room, locked in a room, and they're, f they're constantly fighting. And one wolf represents lightness and hope, and one of them represents darkness and despair. And the question is, well, wh which wolf wins? And the answer is, whichever one you feed. Which comes back to this, I think, in a sort of slightly weird way. Um, you know, the f well, you can have any, the future any color you like, any shape color you like. Um, but we actually have to go out there and create it. And if we just sort of sit back and let it happen, then some of the weirder stuff on, on this map could very, very easily happen to us. Thank you all.